Hello everyone and welcome again to another weekly edition of Moments in Medicine Live. I am Heidi Woodard and today I have a nice sultry voice to welcome you to this chat. I think it might be allergies. I'll, I won't get too close to you too, <laughs> but I do welcome you. Um, I want to remind you all um, every time you chime in and, and tune in and start to comment, the purpose of these chats is for informational purposes only. So if you have questions about the information we discussed today, we highly encourage you to speak individually with your doctor and medical team. Uh, today, I am pleased to be joined with two uh, doctors, Dr. Matthew Lunning and Dr. Krishna Gundabalu. They are both medical oncologists with the Nebraska Medicine Network. Today, we are at the Village Point Nebraska Medicine Campus, and so I just want to thank you both for taking time out of the day thank to you. sit down for this chat. As we're talking, I might be glancing down to see if any questions come in and um, if I have connectivity issues I'll rely on my handy dandy videographer who always comes to the rescue. Uh, we're talking today about blood cancers and so I do encourage you as you're watching if you have those questions and comments chime in. Also after we're done today if you want to ask after the chat we will get back to you with the expertise of their answers. We're going to start today with um, I think probably one of our hotter topics. Um, the CAR T cell therapy, it's a big one. And be before we get into that, we're gonna talk high level about blood cancers in general, because I think maybe the ones that people are most familiar with, le leukemia, lymphoma, but mm -hmm. can you talk at a broad level um, the different types of blood cancers and how someone might know that they need to be seen? Sure, so I'll speak to kind of lymphomas. Uh, lymphomas are, you know, arise from the immune system. Most commonly, they arise from a B lymphocyte. 90% uh, of the time, they're B cell lymphomas. The other 10% represent T cell lymphomas or NK, T, uh, NK. Uh, lymphomas. Uh, lymphoma, uh, lymphocytes are made and grow up in the bone marrow. If they get stuck in the bone marrow, they can become large baby cells and that's where an acute lymphoblastic leukemia starts in the bone marrow from that standpoint. But as these lymphocytes traffic out uh, in, in, uh, into circulation, they take residence in lymph nodes or in other parts of the body. Uh, if a lymphocyte becomes aberrant or abnormal or cancerous, that, that lymphocyte starts to grow and divide. Often it's in the lymph node itself, that lymph node will become enlarged. It will become either apparent based upon symptoms or can be found on just a physical exam where some of our lymph nodes you know, live in the neck underneath their arms or in our growing. And if that's enlarging, often a biopsy is done uh, uh, to help decide uh, what type of lymphoma it is. There are many different kinds of non-Hodgkin's or Hodgkin's lymphoma, over 60 different kinds. And the treatment of those uh, lymphomas differ based upon the name that they're given, uh, rather than just saying one treatment fits all for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Sure. You talked about the bone marrow um, layperson's question. We have bones throughout our entire body. Is there a generic area of the body that that bone marrow is affected more than others? Well, the marrow lives, you know, in the inside the kind of the hard uh, part of the bone, if you will. It's kind of like an M&M, right? Mm -hmm. you know, the, if you think about it, like the chocolate is the bone marrow, or the other analogy I use sometimes is in regards to... <laughs> we might have a dance around for life. <laughs> we have to wave What we do for viewership. Yes. Okay, yes, there we go. <laughs> go ahead. Sorry. I even did YMCA wrong. Uh, Back to the M&M discussion. Yes. I, I locked uh, in on that. Or, or, or the other one I use is like the, is, is the uh, jelly donut analogy where if you think about the jelly uh, is the marrow and the, the donut is the hard part of the bone. Um, and so, you know, in that is where our, our blood making system arises and, you know, going all the way from baby cells to, you know, uh, more adult like cells. Once they get to an adult stage, they get kicked out of the bone marrow only, you know, to take back residence, I guess, if you, you say plasma cells, which are kind of the malignant cell that's uh, seen in multiple myeloma, those take residence back in the bone, uh, in the bone marrow. Um, from that standpoint. But you see marrow um, in most uh, bones in the body. Uh, sometimes we do bone marrow biopsies. We take it from the pelvis just because that is a major site of bone marrow production. Okay. And it, uh, you know, is it of easier access, mm -hmm. uh, I would say, from a procedural standpoint and can get us the information that, that we need. So I should have said when I introduced you both, I mean, you talk about how many different forms there are in just the category non-Hodgkin's. There are so many me trying to do research for this one. <laughs> it wasn't pretty, guys. There's so much out there. So let me have, allow you two to basically tell viewers what are your specific areas of emphasis sure. and expertise. Mm -hmm. 
you want to go first, Dr. Gandabolu? So, yeah, so uh, uh, as uh, Dr. Lanning was pointing it out, that uh, he focuses on the lymphoid uh, uh, blood cancers. So I focus on the myeloid blood cancers. There are different types of myeloid blood cancers. Um, you can broadly put them into two buckets, acute myeloid uh, blood cancers versus chronic myeloid blood cancers, uh, depending on the number of these blast cells, what we call them as present in the bone marrow or in the, in the, in the blood. Uh, if they're more than 20%, we call it as acute uh, leukemia, and less than 20, we call it as chronic myeloid leukemia. Um, so <laughs> chronic myeloid leukemia, there are different types of uh, <laughs> chronic we'll myeloid we'll leukemia. Yeah. Chronic, go ahead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, in the chronic myeloid leukemia, there are myelodysplastic syndromes where typically patients present with low blood counts like anemia or low platelet count or low white blood cell count. And there are a set of diseases called as myeloproliferative neoplasms where patients typically present with higher blood counts, meaning high red blood cells, it's also called as polycythemia, high white blood cell count, or high platelet count like thrombocytosis. So depending on their blood counts and patterns and how the bone marrow looks, mm -hmm. uh, they can be broadly put into chronic myeloid uh, uh, diseases and acute myeloid diseases, yeah. That's good to identify the two main mm -hmm. categories again. Yeah. I'm sure you both don't mm -hmm. ask people to Google, like come to you <laughs> yeah. for the information. But, but there's a lot out there. It, it tends to be a little intimidating. Yeah. So again, if you could emphasize your focus. So I, I see the majority of the patients with uh, the blood cancers arriving from the lymph lymphoid system, so lymphomas, uh, commonly the rising uh, in the lymph node. Uh, some lymphomas and, and uh, will be seen in the bone marrow are kind of infiltrating back into the bone marrow. Um, it knows it's been there before because that's where it's you know grown up. So it's a hospitable environment to, to go in, into the bone marrow. And that can change the staging uh, of our lymphomas if it involves an extra nodal, so outside of a lymph node uh, space. Um, that doesn't mean that it can't go to other organs like the skin or the liver um, as an extra nodal site of disease too. Um, when we kind of try to, when I try to bucket lymphomas, I often uh, speak to my, I say my right hand, my left hand lymphomas. My right hand lymphomas are often the ones that I think about are your aggressive non-Hodgkin's lymphomas. And then on my left hand, and I say my indolent or slow growing non Hodgkin's mm -hmm. lymphomas. The most common right hand lymphoma or aggressive lymphoma would be diffuse large B cell lymphoma, uh, which is the most common non Hodgkin's lymphoma in general. The most common left handed or slow growing indolent lymphoma would be a follicular lymphoma. And these are treated often very differently. There are some similar similarities in treatment. Uh, for instance, in a left hand lymphoma, if it's uh, incidentally found and the patient's otherwise not having any symptoms, you may choose after an uh, in-depth discussion to monitor that lymphoma uh, until it's either causing symptoms or progressing or, or the, the, the need for treatment is felt to be uh, um, there. Versus a right-hand lymphoma, or your aggressive lymphomas, uh, sometimes you're, once you get your ducks in a row with regards to staging and evaluation of, uh, of, of blood counts and um, other organ functions, you may choose to treat right away. Um, in many, many cases when you're giving uh, patients who can uh, be delivered to uh, in uh, full dose chemotherapy, your right hand lymphomas are often being treated with what I call curative intent, which means to be treated and never have that lymphoma come back again. That is the intent. Does it happen all the time? No. On the flip side, in your left hand lymphomas, your slow growing lymphomas, when you tend to right, uh, treat them or when you choose to treat them, uh, the odds are the, uh, is that that lymphoma is going to come back in that person's lifetime. So you're kind of putting it to, uh, mm -hmm. putting it to sleep or putting sure. it down or putting it into remission, mm -hmm. um, but knowing that it will likely come back. Okay. Well, we talk about like you mentioned, various treatment options, and the CAR T-cell therapy gained a lot of attention, um, well, since 2017. In February, in fact, of 2017, Nebraska Medicine had publicly announced um, an, a chimeric antigen receptor. That's what the CAR stands yes, for. Yes, yes. Um, T-cell therapy was available for commercial use for patients who met certain eligibility criteria. Can you describe what that CAR T-cell therapy is and how it works? Sure. So. Uh 
Chimeric androgen receptor T-cell therapy uh, is essentially using your own immune system to fight your cancer. Now we have to, there's been many attempts to use your own immune system, but this is actually taking the, the, a specific part of your immune system called the T-cells, which are um, really uh, part of the line of defense against cancers uh, and against infections uh, um, as part of your native immune system. Uh, what we do in this technology is we uh, uh, take out or remove from the blood T cells, and then they're sent off uh, to a company who engineers those T cells uh, to target a specific antigen or receptor on a cancer cell. Unfortunately, sometimes it still recognizes the normal receptor on a normal cell. Mm -hmm. So you have to be very selective mm -hmm. about what antigen you're going to, uh, going to go after. And in this case, at least in lymphoid malignancies right now, we're targeting CD19, mm -hmm. uh, which is the target for the, the two commercially available uh, um, CAR T cell constructs. They are currently available in diffuse large B cell lymphoma, again, in the relapsed refractory setting. So not as part of upfront therapy but if that lymphoma were to have recurred uh, um, from that standpoint, uh, it is also available in acute lymphoblastic leukemia up to the age of uh, 25. Again, targeting the same, uh, the same um, antigen, but there's only one of the two constructs that are available right now uh, for, for ALL. Again, in the relapse refractory sure. setting. So. Okay. Well, sorry, were you done? I don't want to cut you um, off. I, I feel like you could go on I, about I, this topic. I, I, prob I probably could. Yeah. <laughs> These two guys at dinner parties, I'm telling yeah. you. <laughs> no, I, mean, I certainly want to highlight that point uh, of what Dr. Lani was telling about the acute lymphoblastic leukemia. It is the B type of acute lymphoblastic leukemia patients who are younger than 25 years of age, uh, who had refractory or relapsed uh, uh, a B type of acute lymphoblastic leukemia can receive CAR T cell therapy, uh, a commercial CAR T cell therapy at Nebraska Medicine. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people, if they're interested in learning more about this, um, we have information out on our website on nebraskamed.com, so keep that in mind. Um, well, you talked earlier about AML or acute myeloid leukemia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is the first time this has ever happened. You guys are so lucky. Yeah. <laughs> There we go. Can, we're going to dance as yes. we talk. Can you describe some of the advances you were talking about you know, yeah. before we started? There's several advances. Yeah, so in, in, since 2017, there were so many advances in acute myeloid leukemia. You know, previous to 2017, the leukemia doctors were teased by the lymphoma doctors. <laughs> you know, you guys have this old cocktail of drugs you had been using over the past three decades. There's not much what has happened, but since 2017, a lot of things have changed in the way we treat this acute myeloid leukemia patients, uh, which are, uh, 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 the, the big thing I would say is the so-called targeted treatments have uh, come to the front line. Uh, one common mutation which happens in acute myeloid leukemia patients, nearly 25% of the AML patients have this mutation called as FLT3, also called as FLT3 mutation. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a new drug called as Midostarin, which is used in conjunction with uh, the standard chemotherapy, uh, which has shown better outcomes in patients with AML. And uh, for patients who had uh, a, a type of uh, a leukemia called as therapy-related uh, uh, AML, or uh, patients who had AML which had evolved from MDS, as I was explaining before what MDS is, there's a new drug called as Vixios, which is a, a different formulation of the chemotherapy. It's a called as liposomal formulation of uh, donorubicin and cytarabine, which is FDA approved for this particular type of uh, AML, which conventionally has very poor prognosis. So the other targeted treatments, people hear about this targeted treatments. The idea behind targeted treatments is if the leukemia cells have a special type of mutation, specific type of mutation, which, uh, which is thought to be driving the disease by turning off uh, that particular driver, the leukemia cell growth will slow down. So such uh, three targets were uh, FDA approved. One is in relapsed refractory AML patients. There's a drug called as gilteritinib, which is approved in uh, FLT3 mutated AML patient. There is a drug called as uh, um, ivocidinib and anacidinib. These are the two drugs which are, uh, FDA had approved in, in a mutation called as IDH1 uh, and 2. 
these are the types of uh, genes which are thought to be driving these uh, diseases in, in, uh, in AML, some of the AML patients. Uh, so I think I, I would highlight that a lot of these new changes came into practice and we are using already these uh, uh, you know, updates in, in clinical practice. Great. Mm -hmm. um, how long have you each been practicing with Nebraska Medicine? I will be going on my sixth year being here uh, this summer. Great. So yeah, five plus. So, oh great. Yeah, so you guys have seen a lot of the yeah. same changes that come and go and yeah. well, what, what's something that kind of excites you knowing that there are some, some of the technology is a little slower and then some of the study, the clinical trials might be a little faster. Like what have you seen in those years? What, what's been one of the more exciting things? I think for me it's been watching kind of CAR T cell grow from a grassroots movement, you know, at Nebraska Medicine. Um, really uh, appreciate, you know, the hospital, the administrators believing that this is something that we can do at Nebraska Medicine. Mm -hmm. We learn through the clinical trial mechanism, uh, you know, how uh, to do these. I think, uh, you know, and that's it's a, it's really is a training process and it's a great to learn in the clinical trial arena, but then be able to transcend that experience into the commercial environment. Sure. To offer it to patients, um, you know, where it's very uh, regionally based right now, and who can who has access to, to CAR T cell therapies. Um, but it was we're just not done in diffuse large B cell lymphoma. It's being explored in other non-Hodgkin's lymphomas, being explored in multiple myeloma in, in the clinical trial setting, um, and recently, you know, updates from differing constructs at, with different targets uh, in in going into solid tumor oncology. Um, so really, I think CAR T cells and the technology that it's bringing uh, with it will kind of expand options to patients beyond uh, blood cancers. Um, you know, coming with the, if you will, the institutional uh, expertise of, uh, you know, treating these patients will come down the line and give us, you know, the opportunities to explore uh, this therapy and, and technologies like it in, in other diseases. So we're, I think, well positioned uh, from that standpoint um, to allow that to happen in the next several years and I think that that's something that really excites me and makes me you know happy to get up and uh, um, you know uh, treat patients at uh, at the Fred and Pamela sure. Buffett Cancer Center or at Village Point um, uh, and the excitement that that, uh, that that brings to being able to offer that to patients. That's encouraging news. What about you? And uh, I, I would echo what, uh, what uh, Dr. Lani was telling in addition to that, you know, uh, I'm quite excited uh, to talk about the new cancer center building, what we moved in the last few years. It's amazing. So in 2017, this is a state-of-the-art uh, facility with uh, almost everything which can be done under one single roof. Mm -hmm. I have to say, like, you know, I, I, I trained at uh, many other institutes, uh, institutions outside Nebraska. So they, uh, this is one of the few places in the entire country or maybe in the, in the world where almost a lot of things can be done in, in one spot mm -hmm. and not able to travel to other places. And of course, like participating in cutting edge trials like, uh, like CAR T cells had been certainly in a, a gratifying thing. And, and uh, we also do bone marrow transplants, which is, uh, which is something uh, 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 not common to all centers. And, uh, you know, having a state-of-the-art facility really had advanced the bone marrow transplant program as well. Sure. Mm -hmm. the, the pure volume astounded mm -hmm. me. Right. Um, mm -hmm. When you look this up, average, we average 150 bone marrow transplants a year mm -hmm. since the program's inception yeah, in and, it, and I think that the, the part of the success of the CAR T-cell program was on the on the back of the bone marrow transplant program just being able to have that already expertise in place uh, made it uh, made it more con made us more confident that we could do this but also when companies are coming to you to ask you know, ask you to participate you have to show to them that you can successfully do that in the infrastructure that was in place because of the long history of mm -hmm. the bone marrow transplant program here and the leadership behind that program uh, um, really you know helped I think sure. sway us uh, to be one of those centers that were early uh, in the in the clinical trials absolutely well I think we're about at time I wanted to thank both Dr. Lenning and Dr. Gundabal who joining us today I really appreciate it um, if you didn't know about Nebraska Medicine we are very environmentally friendly <laughs> which is why you joined us for the dance party slash chat uh, we our lights do turn off if we don't have a lot of movement so i'm proud to work for a company that that does take the environment that seriously um we didn't have questions had lots of reactions people are very uh 
thumbs up and hearts uh, for your for your talk today. If we do have questions come in, like I said, afterwards, we'll get them to the appropriate people. You guys can answer them and we'll follow up. Uh, I do want to thank everyone again today. If you want to find a Nebraska Medicine Clinic near you, you can always call uh, 402-559-5600 to book an appointment. You can also obviously be referred by your family practitioner. Um, if you would like more information online, I alluded to earlier, NebraskaMed.com is the website. Um, thanks again for joining us today, and we will see you next Wednesday for the next installment of Moments in Medicine Live.